Welcome to session four of Stacey's summer series for investment real estate. We're so excited you're here and we're going to get started on time. So in today's uh, webinar, we're going to review sessions one, two, and three. I'm going to give you a quick overview of what happened in the first three sessions because this is meant to be watched in a series. And you can always go to stacylovesrealestate.com to watch the um, the webinars from those uh, weeks, those sessions. Um, just keep in mind the hour-long sessions are from Tuesday night and the 30-minute sessions are Wednesday afternoon. So depending on your time constraints or whether or not you want the full detail from the guest speaker who is always on with me on Tuesday and may or may not be on with me on Wednesday. Um, and then we're gonna go into analyzing a property for rental or flip. And then Alan Nockamson, an attorney I've been working with for uh, probably about 10 years now, um, who specializes in real estate, is a really great asset to my clients and to me. Um, he will be speaking to you about owning a property in LLCs versus personal name, which is a topic we discussed um, in the insurance and mortgage uh, weeks because this LLC versus personal name touches um, all three subjects, law, insurance, and mortgage. Um, and then also new construction and condos and why having an attorney is critical for those kinds of properties when you make those purchases. Um, and then lastly, we'll go through some announcements. Um, so in session one, we talked about why you were you know, saving or looking to build wealth. Um, when you have an end goal and you're committed to that end goal, it makes taking the steps towards that end goal a lot easier. Um, most of my clients are building wealth to either uh, fund their retirements or fund uh, kids college or they're simply on a path to building wealth because it's the American dream to own real estate um, So whether you have bought before and are investing in your first property or making your first purchase Real estate is the, the first step in building that wealth for the long term um, I, We also discussed my experience in real estate as a landlord for the past 18 years and my strategy for how I picked properties we also talked about why real estate and you know why people choose real estate over stocks, let's say. Um, and then we, in that first session, we talked about managing your risk with insurance. Uh, one of the biggest um, things I hear from clients about getting into real estate is the fear uh, about opening themselves up to personal liability or having somebody live in a property that they own. So you know, insurance is a great way. Uh, and will be required by the lender in order to protect your asset and to minimize uh, those fears. In the session two, we discussed three strategies to build your portfolio. So step one, buy a primary residence to live in. Step two, um, you want to you know, either move up or you want to use your the equity that you've built up in the home or other cash assets in order to buy the next property. The next thing we discussed um, was the six easy steps to building uh, wealth for real estate or with real estate, and I will cover those towards the end of this uh, segment, segment so that you have an update on that. Um, and then lastly, we talked about financing options for investments with Mike Leotone, whether it was your first one or your second or third property. Session three, we discussed landlording 101 and lease and, and property management with our guest speaker, Jared Gruber of JG Real Estate. Um, all right, so we're going to get into today's content. You will notice that there are handouts associated with this webinar, so please feel free to download those. You'll have the slides from today, and I uploaded the prior um, handouts for from JG real estate and from Chris coin for insurance um, the mortgage was all embedded in the webinar and if you wanted the slide decks from prior web uh, webinars let me know just email me Stacy at Philly living so when you are buying a property to rent you will want to use what we call a capitalization rate or a cap rate a capital rate a capitalization rate you might want to think of it like an, an, a return on investment so whether you're investing in stocks are real estate, um, some other investment, you loan a friend money and they're paying you an interest rate. You just wanna think of a cap rate is basically an interest rate that takes into account the differences that real estate has versus other properties. Um, so on the one hand, you can use a cap rate analysis to compare real estate investments to another kind of investment like stocks, bonds, or other kinds of investments. That's an apples to oranges comparison. 
You can also use a cap rate to compare real estate investments to each other. Um, and the higher the cap rate, the better the return. So typically that means the lower the sales price. Um, so just as an example, as a way of reminding you how this looks. So if you're earning $5,000 on a $100,000 investment in a year, that's a 5% return. In, act in real estate, that would actually be considered good uh, right now in, let's say, central Philadelphia. Um, if you earn $10,000 on $100,000 invested, that's a 10% return. Um, if you were able to get a 10% cap rate on a real estate investment in Philadelphia, that would be amazing or awesome. Um, and then $15,000 on $100,000 would be 15%, and that would be unbelievable. Um, so you want to keep in mind that these rates of return, while as they go up, in, uh, in cap rate as they get higher and a better return, that means that there's an increased risk associated with that property. So if you were to buy an investment property in Rittenhouse Square, for example, there are some investors in there that are maybe making a three to 5% um, cap rate on their property. Um, and the reason being is it's an expensive place to buy. Um, the rents may not be drastically higher to get them more return, and yet their investment, it's the best, you know, as far as economics go, part of the city, such that they're pretty confident that they'll always have a tenant um, and they'll always be able to earn, that'll always appreciate. Um, whereas in other parts of the city, so, you know, neighborhoods that are rapidly changing uh, or have lower price points, compared to the rents that are available uh, to the investor there, you know, you're starting to increase your return. Um, then there are parts of the city where you can get properties for 50,000, 80,000, 100,000, and comparatively the rents are amazing um, compared to the, the uh, payment or the property price. Um, and yet, you know, you might be dealing with a housing, um, you know, program like Section 8 that requires a, an extra level of effort and learning on your part, um, you know, or it just might be neighborhoods that you're not familiar with. Um, so you want to consider that the higher the cap rate, the better the return, but also that is commiserate with the, the uh, risk of your investment. All right. So since the cap rate analysis can be very extensive, um, and when you're comparing, let's say, uh, real estate to stocks, you know, the, you want, you might want to consider um, cash on cash return on investment, for example, and other um, more complex analyses. Um, because number one, your tax rate is going to be different based on how you earn the money, and number two, you're leveraging when you buy real estate, you're typically putting down 20 to 25 percent, whereas when you buy a stock, for example, you're usually paying 100 percent of the value of that stock. Um, so the cap rate, uh, the extensive cap rate in the analysis is also going to take into consideration those major things that differentiate a real estate, a piece of real estate with a more intangible kind of investment like a stock, a bond, et cetera. So that would include repairs, property taxes, property insurance, utilities that the landlord might pay, licenses, management, and vacancy factors. So I have a five sheet worksheet that can do an extensive analysis and you know as a client you're you know you're more than welcome to it um, but what i've developed over the years is what i call a simple cap rate analysis or like a back of the envelope analysis so if you know that you're going to be investing in real estate you really and you know let's say it's going to be in the same a similar neighborhood the insurance is going to be similar the property management fee is going to be similar and you can account for repairs based on you know, the money needed to get the property in its uh, best condition, um, then you don't need to consider vacancy rate, property management, insurance. So if you have a whole uh, variety of factors that are going to be the same, whether you buy property A or property B, then just use what's different and make your life so much easier. Um, not many people are like me where they love math. Um, so make it simple on yourself and just use what's different between two pieces of real estate and do the simple cap rate analysis, which would include the taxes, any landlord paid utilities that are different, um, the rent and the asking price. Um, and I said landlord paid utilities based on what's different is that if you're comparing two single family properties to each other, uh, you can pretty much assume that you'll bill for water. 
Um, but if you are buying a single family property ver or comparing a single family versus maybe a duplex where rent or water is included in the rent, you might want to consider the water you're paying on behalf of the tenants in the duplex versus the water that you're not paying um, for the single family. So you only use what's different between the two properties. So here is the formula for the cap rate, um, regardless of whether you use the extensive or the, um, the simple cap rate. So generally speaking, it's net operating income divided by purchase price. So because it's a math formula, if you wanted to figure out, um, you know, the maximum purchase price that you could pay based, to, based on the net operating income or the cap rate, you'd simply just adjust the formula. Um, so if you ever wanted me to help you with that, I'd be happy to do that. Um, so the net operating income would include the monthly rent times 12 plus any other, or rather, uh, yeah, plus any other income. So if you get rent from a garage rental on the property, or if you charge for laundry and get any other income in that way, then you can add that in, and then you minus the expenses. So taxes, um, the landlord paid utilities uh, would be the most two common ones that are expenses that would be different between the two properties. Here's the uh, two examples of cap rates. So you know, again, this is a handout, so you can download it, and then you can just, you know, fill in the blanks if you have another property that you wanted to do a simple cap rate analysis on. Um, so in example one, we've got the purchase price of 200000 and let's say the rental income is 1000 a month, and the annual taxes are 2200 and you're paying for water 600 a year. And you're also paying common electric. So the assumption is most likely that this one is a duplex where you're covering the water for the tenants and there might be a shared um, hallway uh, and exterior lights that you as a landlord would be paying about $25 a month. So the net operating income would be $1,000 a month times 12 minus the 2200 minus the 600 and minus the 300. And that gives you 8900 in net operating income for the year. When you divide that by the purchase price, then you'll get a cap rate of 4.45. Now, if you look at example two, the purchase price of 135, just because it's a lower price doesn't mean it is a better cap rate. It just happens that it is based on 800 a month in rental income and 1100. So the taxes are half as much and you're not paying for water or electric for this tenant. So the net operating income is 800 times 12 months minus the 1100 and that equals $8,500 in net operating income. You divide that by the price of 135,000 and you get a 6.3% cap rate. So you can simply compare one property to another by plugging in these numbers and whichever has the higher cap rate um, is the you know, better investment when you're only looking at the numbers. Um, there's a lot of qualitative factors that make that will let you know whether or not it's a good property investment for you um, and, and otherwise. So, and those were covered, you know, in the prior sessions um, when we're talking about you as an owner of property, because it's not so much a, a passive investment as maybe stocks or bonds, it is definitely more active. Um, and I always like to use the test, would I feel comfortable to pick up the rent if I had to? Um, that's kind of my gauge of where um, I wanna rent. Um, and you'll notice that this doesn't factor in whether or not you're getting financing or not, um, because it's irrelevant. This is all about the property and whether or not this property is cash flowing, is um, profitable at the end of the year. Whether you get financing and let's say you're putting in the 200,000 to buy this property or the 135 plus closing costs on each, um, that's irrelevant that will change the return on investment based on the cash you've input. And that's a whole nother conversation. All right, so now we're moving out of keeping the property and we're looking at um, a property that you might buy to flip. So you're looking to buy a property to renovate and then resale to the next buyer. Um, and one thing I wanna mention before we actually get to this one is that if let's say the property at 135 needed $30,000 of renovation in order to get 800 a year, well, that's going to impact the cap rate um, and that will decrease it. 
So I'm just going to do a quick example here and or do a quick calculation. Um, I have my calculator open. So let's say I said I needed $30,000 in renovation. So that would be a purchase price and acquisition cost of 165. So I'm going to take 8,500 minus 165. And now my cap rate went down to 5.2. So that's still higher than the example one, but now you get to factor in, do you want to do the work? Because you might prefer to buy a property that's already turnkey and you don't have to do the work, which is definitely valuable. Because as I like to say, you'll pay for it in time, money, or aggravation, and you get to choose. So example one is you're paying for it in money. In example two, you might be paying for it in time and money, plus you might be spending uh, or getting ag aggravated during the process. Um, so yeah, so you get to figure all that out, what works for you. All right, after renovation value. So the after renovation value must be able to cover all of the elements of the project. So um, on the left, going counterclockwise, we've got the purchase price and closing costs of the original property. And when you go to sell it, you're going to have closing cost, you know, commissions, transfer tax, et cetera. So you'll have closing costs after you've renovated it and when you send it, sell it to the end user. Um, you'll obviously want to make profit on it. And then you'll have construction costs. So the, you know, really what we're doing is solving for X. If you know what the purchase price and closing costs will be, and you can anticipate what it will sell for, with, and then you can easily tell what the closing costs would be, you can then say, well, now I have X dollars left for construction, construction costs and profit. And from there, you can see, you know, is the profit large enough based on the construction costs I know I will need? Um, similarly, if let's say you know you have a property in mind, you know what it will sell for, um, and so then you can take out those closing costs when you sell it, um, and you know what the construction costs are, um, and you know what profit margin you want to make, then you can say, well, I can only spend this maximum purchase price for this property. So it's really a matter of what information do you have when you're analyzing a property uh, and going into it knowing how much cash you have access to for the purchase, for the construction costs, and ideally how much profit you'd like to make on that project. Solving for X, what it would take to make you know, your target profit of 50,000, let's say, or if you know that the seller will only take 150 for the property, you can figure out what the rest of the pie looks like. Um, and let's say you know the before and after price and the renovation costs, then you know what your net profit would be after closing costs are deducted. So the next steps to your, for your next property um, basically is number one, to determine your purchasing power. Number two, identify areas and property types that fit your budget. Um, visit and analyze the properties, make an offer, go through your inspection contingency and other contingencies, and then lease out that property, or if you're converting your primary into a rental, then leasing that out. And simply, if you're buying a property to live in as your first, then you don't need to rent out anything. Um, so the first step is to email me, and I'd be happy to fit you with an investment property or your next primary residence. Email me, Stacy at phillyliving.com, your primary address, how much you owe, uh, your pity me payment, so principal interest, taxes, insurance, and mortgage insurance, if any, and then and then any assets that you, cash assets you might have in uh, for the purchase. He, like I said, I met him probably about 10 years ago. I really admired the way he works with my clients and his clients um, because he doesn't overly exaggerate. Like sometimes, you know, when you work with an attorney, everything is a, um, you know, is a big deal. And Alan is very practical and pragmatic. Um, so he'll tell you the pros and cons of a situation. And he, our philosophies are very similar. It's like, here's what could happen based on the information we have. And, you know, you could, best case, worst case, you can make a decision. Um, and what's common, you know, in Philadelphia real estate and what is kind of unique to, to the marketplace so that you can make your best decision. Um, so he will be covering why and when to use an LLC, and two reasons I always recommend my clients to use an attorney in a transaction, even for a single family home, 
is if it's a condo or new construction or a planned community with an HOA. So I, with that, I will let Alan take it away. Uh, thank you, Stacey. Uh, again, my name is Alan Offenson. I'm an attorney in Offenson, PC. I've been practicing law for almost 20 years. And I've been working with Stacy and other uh, realtors in town who represent investors. Uh, so one of the first things you want to do when you're thinking about purchasing a property is how you're going to own it. A lot of my clients, especially first-time investors, look at owning a property via a limited liability company or otherwise known as an LLC. And one of the reasons why is because LLCs have the least amount of corporate formalities. If you're going to own a property via a limited partnership, a corporation, um, you, you'll have more corporate formalities, like you'll have to have requirements in terms of meeting, in terms of uh, just general uh, corporate formalities. So most people like focus on a limited liability company, and, and why do they focus on having a corporate entity? It really all has to do with your liability, and that's the first item we're going to talk about personal versus corporate. So anyone can own the property personally. The reason why as an investor, you probably want to own it as a limited liability company is because if there's an issue with the property, if for instance, there's a slip and fall and it's not covered by insurance, if you're going to be counterclaimed by a tenant, for instance, in terms of uh, you know whatever services you're providing or lack thereof, if you sell the property because this is a flip, they're going to sue whoever owns the property. So you want to think about owning it as a limited liability company. Now there's you know, obviously negatives in terms of owning as a limited liability company um, is the financing opportunities. Now Stacy will tell you that, you know, and again, I believe she had a mortgage broker on um, earlier uh, in this series, not all banks are going to, to lend to a limited liability company for some um, assets. So if you're dealing with a single family home that you're looking to buy and to rent out, there may not be the products out there in terms of having it owned by a limited liability company. So you're going to have to personally own it. And then I'm sure Stacy also had an insurance broker, I believe, as part of this series, who's going to tell you from an insurance perspective, perspective, how you're going to protect yourself if you own it personally. But ideally, you're going to want to own it as a limited liability company. Now, it's form over substance because typically when you own it as a limited liability company, the only collateral is the asset itself. So they would, the bank probably would want other collateral, meaning you as the investor. So a lot of times from a, you know, a lending perspective, you'll have to be a personal guarantor. But again, it's better than having, you know, you personally on the hook, you know, for a potential judgment. And that's the other thing that, you know, I have is item number two is asset protection. You're probably going to want to own the property as a limited liability company. Just that entity is going to own that asset. So for instance, if we're going to buy 123 Main Street, like I would recommend to my client that it would be 123 Main Street LLC. And that the only asset of 123 Main Street LLC is that actual property itself. And again, just to reiterate, any judgment that is against an entity or person becomes an, a lien against any asset that entity or person owns. So again, if 123 Main Street LLC owns multiple properties, each of those properties, and there's an issue with 123 Main Street, each of those properties then um, would have a, a judgment attached to each of them. So again, that's why you want to have sole purpose entities as an LLC. Uh, and then the fourth thing that I talk about what, when and why to use an LLC is just the corporate paperwork. Again, it's a lot simpler than other corporate entities. You know, again, when you form an LLC, you'll form it with the Pennsylvania Department of State. You'll do a certificate of formation, which is, which is an administrative filing. And then in terms of like the actual inner workings of the LLC, you can have a sole member LLC. You can have a multi-member LLC. You can have the LLC run by the members themselves. You can appoint a manager to, to run the LLC. And that would all be in the operating agreement. 
again, it's a little bit more sophisticated in terms of owning it. It's a limited liability company, but again, it's something to really think about when you are purchasing a property. All right, so the next thing we're gonna be talking about is new construction. So new construction is a different animal than owning something that's been there forever. So if you're an investor and you're not going to develop the properties yourself and renovate the properties yourself, I have a lot of investors who buy like, for instance, like, you know, single family homes, you know, where if there's enough equity in terms of like what, you know, um, Stacey was talking about like a cap rate, if there's enough money to be made in terms of buying in the neighborhood, at a low enough like purchase price where you know hopefully the property appreciates people will buy a new construction so when you're purchasing a property from a developer who recently renovated the property like something to consider when you're purchasing the property is that even the developer doesn't know what he doesn't know and what do i mean by that when you're buying a pre-existing home the developer or the person that owns the property knows what's 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 good and bad about that property when a property is being developed for the first time it's never been lived in so it's really important to to have some security in terms of a builder's warranty to make sure that the builder or the developer comes back after you purchase the property if there's issues right so there's there's two people that you need to focus on when you're buying a new construction property the builder and the developer so the developer is the one who you're actually purchasing the property from, right? So when you're purchasing a property, obviously you need to do your investigation of who the, who the seller is, right? The developer, are they a trustworthy person? But equally important is to focus on the builder because the builder is the one that's actually building the property. Sometimes they're one and the same, most times they're not. So when you're looking at a builder, you know, you're gonna get a warranty from the person who's actually building the property. Again, we were talking about LLCs and asset protection. Same thing goes on with builders. A lot of builders, like especially when they're, they're also the developer, will form LLCs for this specific project. So you need to find out, first of all, is this a builder that builds across multiple projects? Because if you have to potentially sue this builder, will you be able to actually get some type of assets from this builder? And then you should also investigate the builder's uh, reputation in town. So again, simple thing to do is to look on the internet, look up the court system to see if this builder has been sued, whether this entity or find out who the principal of this uh, of the builder is. And then in terms of the scope and duration of the warranty, right? Most warranties are for a year, right? In in Pennsylvania, make sure that you know you understand the length of the warranty because you can only get you know work done for a period in time that the warranty is in effect. And you usually have to put a claim within that period of time. So make sure you, you understand the period of time, the, the mechanism to actually make a claim, because usually there's a, the warranty states like you have to put it in writing, you have to send it in certain methods, things like that. And then the scope of the warranty. Not all warranties are created equal. Usually the warranty will have exceptions like normal wear and tear, like maybe some settling. So you really need to look at what the, what the warranty entails. Before you even enter into an agreement of sale, you should probably have an opportunity to look at that warranty because I have a lot of clients who are given the warranty and see the, first, the warranty the first time at the time of closing. It's not simply to say you're gonna get a one-year warranty, builder's warranty at the time of closing. You really want to see the nuts and bolts of that warranty. The, another thing to focus on in new construction in Philadelphia, there are, you, I'm sure you've heard about tax abatements. Again, tax abatements, when most people think about it, it's not, a, a, and it, this deals with the real estate taxes, it's not an abatement of all real estate taxes on the property. What happens is when a property is either renovated, where it's a pre existing structure, or it's, it's newly constructed, a certain portion of the assessed value of the property will be abated from the tax calculation. So when you're dealing with a newly constructed property that's built from the ground up, you're gonna have exempt from the taxation 
the assessed value of the building structure, right? It's an incentive for the builder to build and the developer to build, and then it's, it's an incentive for someone to buy the property. So let's just give an example. Say the property, the land is worth $100,000. Say that the building structure is worth $200,000. Over the course of 10 years, if it's a newly constructed property, the assessed value of the building itself will be exempt from taxation. So in Philadelphia, essentially, for based on the tax rate now, for every $100,000 in assessed value, you pay $1,400 in taxes. So an example I gave, assuming that the building structures were $200,000 and the land is worth $100,000, the person would pay $1,400 in taxes year one, and exempt from taxation, which they would have otherwise paid, is $2,800, right? Now, the land goes up in value over time, so you'll continue paying whatever the tax rate times, whatever the assessed value is over the course of 10 years. What would be exempt from taxation is the value of the building structure. Now, in terms of re renovation, uh, it's the, the post-improved value of the property, the increase value of the property after the improvements are made. So again, you have the same thing with the land. The land's worth what the land's worth over the course of 10 years. Say the pre-improved value of the building was $100,000, and now because of the improvements, the value of the building is $200,000. So that $100,000 spread in the improved value of the building because of the improvements made is exempt from taxation over the course of 10 years. But again, the building structure here will increase in value. So you're paying the pre-improved value of the building over the course of 10 years, and that will increase over time. The biggest thing to focus on when you're purchasing a property that is advertised as tax abated is to make sure that the abatement was filed on time, that you've received the paperwork uh, with from the city, um, and that it's signed at the time of closing. And then actually, it's not effective until you actually submit it after closing um, with the city. So really focusing on, was it filed timely? Did you get the paperwork at closing? And did you file the paperwork on time? Those are really three things to focus on. Um, now, even if it was filed on time, and we're talking about tax compliance, like if the, if the developer filed the tax abatement application on time, but they're not tax compliant with the city, meaning they owe taxes to the city, they owe even a water bill to the city, you're not going to get the tax abatement. So you really need to do your due diligence before closing and at the time of closing to make sure you will get that tax abatement. Otherwise, I've seen clients after closing not get the tax abatement and then their investment you know, situation is in dire straits. Other thing to focus on... Like, Alan? Yeah. Alan, I just wanted to confirm one thing and just uh, reiterate something that you said. When you're getting a tax abatement for the renovation, so you bought the property, let's say it was worth a hundred, you invested a hundred thousand, and now it's worth three hundred. The abatement only res is only attached to the amount of improvements, right? Not the That's basically. Correct. Okay, so it could trigger at some point. The city sees it sold for, um, let's say, if you sold it for three hundred, they're really only freezing a hundred thousand. That's correct. They're freezing a hundred thousand. It's the it's the difference between the pre-improved value of the building and the post-improved value of the building. That difference is what the abated amount is. But it's based on the uh, actual cost of the improvements on the permits, right? Well, I mean that's a. I mean, yeah. I mean, we're going through this. We're touching on a, on a very like basic level so it's it's really how so you can put forty thousand dollars into a property hypothetically but it can improve the the value of the building more or less or equal to it really depends right as as you know um the best developers are the ones who take a little and create a lot right so i mean uh, one of the issues that a lot of developers um, come across, or at least people who buy from developers, is that they understate the value of the cost of construction on the building permit. So that's a, another thing to focus on. I mean, again, we can talk a whole, we can have a whole lecture just on tax abatements. Right, but right. But when, when you're applying for the tax abatement, 
the city goes based on what the alleged cost of construction is. So, but the building permits are, the, the fees for a building permit is based on the cost of construction. So a lot of the builders actually undervalue or misstate how much they're actually paying because if they pay $10,000 in improvements versus $100,000, that's a big difference in how much the fee is for the actual building permit. It's important right. from someone who buys from a developer to have an accurate value because if they're if the if the abatement's based on 10,000 versus 100,000, well the abatement's going to be you know worth a lot less, right? To someone who's buying a property quote unquote where the improvement is 10 versus 100. So that's another thing to focus on as well. So, but you couldn't say the abatement, you couldn't say the abatement should be worth based on the 200,000 of construction costs and improved value, right? It would have to be on the construction costs, whatever you claim they are. Whatever the, de whatever the developer claims. So again, before you even sign an agreement of sale or during the due diligence period, you should really have an attorney review the tax abatement application, making sure it was filed timely. Usually, at at you know at the time it's being the property is being marketed, the, the developer usually has paperwork back from the city, you know, indicating whether the abatement has been approved. It doesn't tell you how much the new assessed value is. That doesn't happen really until after closing, but you can at least see if it's been approved. But more importantly. As part of the abatement application, you have to include the building permit so you can see how much the developer has actually claimed, yeah. you know, in terms of the alleged improvement. But again, you won't know the assessed value of the new assessed value of the property most times until after closing. So sometimes you can talk to the assessor and kind of find out because, again, I'm sure you, you, you know, you've talked when, with a mortgage broker as part of this series, what your real estate taxes are going to be. Because real estate taxes, a lot of times with financing, is escrowed. So sometimes they won't know how much to escrow, you know, based on a, a, a newly developed property. So a lot of times you do have to kind of figure that out beforehand. And there are issues sometimes where a, 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 an, an over amount is assessed or escrowed because people don't know what the assessed value is. Right. And to be clear for the to be clear for the audience, the new construction tax abatement is the most common. It is very uncommon for us to find in the marketplace somebody selling a property with the abatement that is covering major renovations. Um, I, you know, for every 95 properties I've seen with new construction, maybe I've seen five in the latter category. Um, but what I do believe this is showing you is that some of these things that you need to learn about the builder and developer are outside the scope of your typical real estate transaction and out so outside the scope of my expertise and that's why I always and this is you know I've obviously this has happened to me before I learned you know the hard way and that's when I've learned to always advise to get a real estate attorney when you see there's a builder's warranty because sometimes it's not what's included it's also what's not included and there's no standard builder's warranty so that's where Alan's expertise really comes into play. Plus the tax abatements, you know, make, you know, reviewing, making sure everything was filed appropriately and doing the extra due diligence about the tax compliance. Um, and not to mention, just one quick aside, the new construction agreement of sale does not favor buyers at all. It's not like your resale contract where you have a 10 day inspection period and you can terminate and get your deposit money back. Uh, regardless of what the inspection comes up with. So that's why having Alan, uh, you know, help review the new construction agreement to sale, let you know the pitfalls um, and help build out that extra language to protect you um, surrounding the inspections, the builder's warranty and the tax abatements is critical. And with that, I will let you continue on with your punch list conversation. Yeah, and, and actually that's a good se segue because a lot of times what we add to new construction uh, agreement of sale is is discussing the punch list. Uh, again, the new construction agreement of sale uh, merely states that you know the parties have to agree to a punch list prior to closing. They don't discuss like any type of escrows. So again, you know when you're purchasing a property, most times the, the builder or the developer is going to state, when I get a certificate of occupancy, you know that you know from the city of Philadelphia. 
that's when you can move in. And that's not always the case. You know, a certificate of occupancy doesn't mean substantial completion. A, substi a certificate of occupancy means that the property is habitable. But when you're purchasing a property of a significant value, you want it more than habitable, especially when it's an investment, right? So, you know, if you're purchasing a property like around Rain House Square and you're going to have a certain type of client, you know, or tenant, you want to make sure that it's it's as nice as possible because every thing that's going to go wrong or potentially go wrong with this property even if you have a builder's warranty they're going to be calling you so you want to make sure it's as complete as possible so certificate of occupancy doesn't mean in in a lot of ways substantial completion and it clearly doesn't mean final completion so when you have like an agreement to sell before you sign it you really got to put a tough punch list uh, pr uh, process together to make sure that you know if you know you're going to go to the closing table that you have a couple go arounds at this right so you should have a mechanism in place where not just a pre settlement walkthrough but there could be multiple inspections of the property because once the, first of all once it, beyond the punch list once the walls are closed to your to the property you have no the inspector is going to have no idea if things were done right from an electrical a plumbing situation so that's so you may have want to have multiple steps of inspections but once we reach the point where the you know the developer believes that they're substantially complete you really want to have a situation where maybe you it's a two-step process where maybe a couple weeks before closing you walk through and by the way you should walk through with a duly licensed professional inspection company because again all you're going to see as a person and even it doesn't matter how sophisticated you are you're going to see the aesthetics right you don't know what you don't know that's why you hire people like stacy myself you know the mortgage lender the insurance broker it's like we have seen enough unfortunately over our lives or our careers to you know to you want to learn from other people's mistakes so you want to have an inspector there who's going to scrutinize the work to the best of their ability. Again, when the walls are closed, you're limited in some respects. So you probably want to create a punch list with the inspector and, and the seller slash developer and have the seller then com, you know, complete the punch list even like maybe a couple days beforehand where whatever that punch list is. After like say say maybe like 72 hours before closing, if there's still issues, you know, you go in the you go with the inspector again to the property and with the seller, if there's still more issues, maybe you then like focus on whatever those big ticket items are, making sure they're done before closing, and then you'll have a pre-sellment walkthrough. And if there's still items that are, are, are that need to be dealt with, that's where you need to have a mechanism where they're should be an escrow right because i know you have a builder's warranty the builder is supposed to finish the work that's beyond punch list items if there's any issues but once the developer has your money like there i've seen situations where they walk away that's why the reputation of a builder slash developer you really need to focus on someone who cares about their work cares about their work product cares about their reputation but with the punch list Again, if you don't, if they don't finish it, you're going to have to finish it. So really, you need to escrow potentially enough money that they care to finish the work. If you under escrow how much money that they're going to, that you know, that's going to be held in terms of the sale proceeds, you know, they'll make a business decision. Well, I think I'm just going to walk away because it's more expensive for me to actually deal with the problems, right? And then when we're talking about escrow, it's not with you, it's not with the seller. It's where some third party is going to hold the funds and it's only going to release it when both parties actually agree that the work has been done, um, you know, to satisfaction of both parties. Now, the timing of completion, again, the new construction uh, agreement of sale, I believe, has like a 30 day window, but, you know, it could be extended, you know, reasonably. Well, you need to put a tight time frame on how quickly the developer slash builder is going to complete the work. And if they don't complete the work within that time frame, then you'll be able to do it at the seller's and builder's uh, cost. Again, if this is an investment property, the longer the work is not completed, the, the longer it's going to take you to find that 
tenant because that tenant's not going to want to deal with these issues. So again, it's imperative that you get the work done as quickly as possible and, and have a tight time frame. And then the remedies, right? You know, not only would you get reimbursement of whatever you would spend if the work's not done in a timely fashion, but you really should have an attorney's fee provision because you don't want to come out of pocket if the developer slash builder doesn't do the right thing. If you have to hire an attorney to enforce some of these provisions, then again, make it incumbent on the seller slash builder to actually reimburse for your attorney's fees. Because if you're paying me, that's money out of your pocket. It goes, it goes, you know, towards, you know, any profits you would have uh, sustained, but for these breaches by the builder slash developer. Um, the next thing to focus on in, in the final portion of my discussion is condominiums and planned communities. So now, just to give you a heads up, Alan, we have about five minutes just to wrap up condos and planned communities. All right, sounds good. Like I said, a lot of this is meaty stuff. So, you know, I apologize for the uh, length of my discussion, but even just these three things are really stuff that you really need to focus on. So condominiums and planned communities, right? So Stacey, we kept talking about like, oh, you're gonna buy a single family house, you're gonna buy a single fa family house. So we deal with a lot of um, investors who buy in these condominiums and planned communities, right? So, you know, say you have a walk up, a three unit walk up in the city of Philadelphia, right? and you're buying one of the units, right? You're gonna to wanna to get what's called a 3407 certificate. So what's a 3407 certificate? The, you know, if this is for a resale, that means the person who you're buying the property from needs to get a document from the condo association. If this document's gonna state, you know, if they're, you know, who owns the property, you know, what the assessments of the property are, like, so, you know, this is a quasi-governmental entity, the, the, the condo has an association, you know, so you're paying, like, you know, monthly assessments, which are like taxes, right, to upkeep the common elements and areas of the property. So what are the assessments? Because, again, that eats into your cap rates, right, uh, in the terms of those are your costs, right, the cost of doing business. So what are your assessments? Are there any special assessments that are gonna be due because a lot of times what you're gonna see with the condominiums is that the, the assessments are artificially low, there's not enough money in, in, in the piggy bank for the association to actually like pay their what what they owe for whether it's snow removal, landscaping, whatever, or people are just not paying their assessments, so they have to come up with more assessments for the people that do pay. So you need to focus on how much these common assessments are, how much are the special assessments. Sometimes there's big projects, and that will be in the 34072. Are there capital improvements and expenditures that are in the horizon? And you know, then the other thing to focus on, and I think that's in the governing documents that we were talking about, is the budget, like of the association. You can take a look to see are they running a, a, a tight ship? Is the association one that is collecting enough funds for whatever cost they have. You know, you can take a look in the budget. How much are they paying for attorney's fees? If the more they're paying for attorney's fees, that means there's delinquent uh, unit owners. The other thing to focus on, and th this goes beyond the governing documents, and this goes from a lending perspective, if there are too many units in, in, a, in a condo or the plant community that are being rented out, you're gonna have issues in terms of uh, borrowing money for your unit, you know, in terms of purchasing a unit, but then if you have to sell it as well, that's something that's gonna limit your pool of potential buyers because they're not gonna be able to, only some, some people are gonna be able to pay for cash if financing is limited because there's too many rental units. You know, you have to focus on that. Um, you know, if, you know, one of the things to focus on in terms of when you're renting a property is like, are there any limitations on renting? right you know some buildings they limit the amount of rentals because of the thing that i mentioned about the financing limitations so are there limitations in terms of rentals you know are there limitations in terms of you know how how long the the rental period has to be because you know a lot of the governing documents require rentals to be for at least six months some of them at least a year you know we you know stacy hasn't mentioned this but 
the other investment vehicle you can have besides like renting to the traditional tenant is like an Airbnb. Again, some associations prevent like Airbnbs from the short term stays. Some, you know, some have no mention of that, but that's something to focus on. The other thing to focus on in terms of documentation, if you really want to get, you know, dig deep, is like, you know, the meeting minutes, right? So again, every time the association meets with their members, they have to have minutes of like what happened during their meetings. You'll get a feel of like what type of building this is, right? Is this a building that's kind of relaxed? Or the, you know where the members do whatever they want, which is you know cuts both ways, good and bad. Or is it one where they're really like you know uh, they they really give a difficult time to their to their members? Because if you're an investor, you know you don't want to have a situation where the members are constantly complaining about your tenants and and things like that. The other thing to focus on, and again I'm jumping around, we're talking about a lot of stuff, is you know what their pet policy is, right? So that goes into rules and regs. Again, the more restrictions in the governing documents, the, 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 the smaller your pool of available tenants are, right? So we're in Philadelphia, if you're in Center City, you know, do you, is this part of a condo building that doesn't allow dogs or cats? If that's the case, now you're limiting who can actually rent your property. So I think that's, a, you know, I, you know, we talk, you know, we can talk about other things, Stacey, but I think, maybe that's a good place to stop. Okay, well, just to add some clarity, a 5407 is for a planned community. That's right. So, yeah, so I used to live in a row of nine homes where we had a shared driveway that led to a parking lot in the back. So whatever applied for the condo 3407 would apply for the planned community 5407, but I own the land and my house, but I shared in the uh, maintenance of this driveway and the insurance thereof. Um, and then lastly, we could just say, when you're buying a new property that's a condo versus a resale, you have a different number of days to review the documents. And these are hundreds of pages of legalese. And as you can see, it can be very complex and it can also affect your resale value. So that's why I always recommend, have an attorney read it with you, pay the experts to do what they do. Um, and that's what Alan does and for my clients. So. Um, and lastly, actually, lastly, I want to say this about condominiums and planned communities. Think of it this way. So if let's say you're buying um, one of three condos in a building, you know, the smaller the number of units, the more intimate the um, management of the association there will be, and the more impact each individual owner will have on that association, for better or for worse. So it's like a mini form of government. And if you've got a real jerk and they're not paying and they're just miserable to live near, well, that's kind of sucky for you. Um, versus, but you might have more flexibility as to what you can do in the condo. Um, versus if you live in a building with a hundred units, you, you may have you know, fewer um, or more restrictions on what you can do, but there's more likely that you'll, you know, more people are contributing and, you know, Alan can correct me if I'm wrong, if, the health of the association is more likely when you have more people, but certainly the cost is divided over more people. So hypothetically, that should be the case. That's um, correct. Anything you wanted to add to wrap up the condo? Yeah, I mean, again, just with the condominium, you know, you saw the 15-day period versus the seven-day period. That deals with like a new condominium building or a new planned community. And what that means is that the for a condominium, there's a the deal is voidable for 15 days until you get this public offering statement with literally, like Stacy said, hundreds of pages, which you should review with your attorney slash, or if you don't have an attorney realtor, and you can back out a deal at any time during that voidable 15 day period. It's seven days for uh, a planned community. And if you're buying it from someone who just owns a condominium, the deal's voidable for five days, according to the PAR form, until you receive the condo document. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to know what your time frames are and then what your rights to certain documents are when you're dealing with a condominium and plan community. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right. So thank you, Alan. I'm going to put my video back on as we wrap up. Um, so again, this is Alan's contact information and he's got a ton of 
articles and he's won tons of awards. So you could go to his website and see all about that. Give him a call, email him. And if you have any questions, make sure you raise your hand or ask in the chat bar. Um, of course, I'm gonna make a plug for Host for Hospitals. So a lot of the people I work with are very generous hearted people and maybe not have all the money to give, but they want to open up, you know, give their resources. And if you have an extra spare bedroom in the home you live in, um, and you want to provide a space for somebody who's visiting the area hospitals, it will greatly enhance their experience while going through a hard time dealing with medical issues. Um, so you could go to lodging at hostforhospitals.org or visit hostforhospitals.org and see more about the organization. It's really as simple as having an in-house meeting, like your in your house meeting with uh, their coordinator and seeing if the program's right for you, if that space is right for them, and then once approved, responding yay or nay if you can host somebody when the need arises. So it could be really as frequent or as infrequent as you desire. Um, two weeks from now is our last session of the five sessions. We'll be talking about using self-directed IRAs to invest in real estate, um, 1031 exchanges, and more. Um, so we're open for questions. And I'll just slide through the last deck while you are thinking of your question or raising your hand. Um, this is just to show you who spoke what dates and then all the contact information. So again, this is a downloadable, um, you know, is downloadable as a handout. And then lastly, of course, kellerinc.com has three great books to guide you in investing. So the MREI, Hold and Flip. So the Millionaire Real Estate Investor, Hold if you plan on holding for rentals, and flip if you would like to resell a property that you renovated. 